from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's great to be here with you today. It is absolutely glorious outside for our very first day of spring. I've got my boys out on the driveway playing basketball. It's after school time, but it is absolutely gorgeous here. I think we've hit a high of 47 degrees today uh, in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and up here, that means that we're running around in flip-flops and shorts, so I really realize in the rest of the country, a 47 degree day might not be the greatest thing. But up here, we are just relishing it because we have had the most ferocious winter like so many other parts of the country. But in Minnesota, to say that you've had a really bad winter, and I consider myself to be a pretty hardy Minnesotan, you know it's been a really bad winter. The forecast for the week is all over the map. I talked to my mom this morning and she indicated we're going to have some freezing rain in the morning when I'm taking the kids to school tomorrow. So I tell you what, we're going to milk this day. We're going to wring it out for everything it's got and just take in every rain of sun. It's been a long, long time. So anyway, I have a fantastic show for you today. I'm interviewing Stephen Dovelo of Earthworm Technologies. But before I get into that, I just want to remind you that you can review all of the information that we're going to cover in the show today in the show notes, which are located on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you'll find the Still Growing podcast in the top menu. So feel free to to look through all of the shows that have been done to date. You can go through all of the different episodes. I tell you what, people are so generous with information, and there's so much available online these days that you can pretty much research almost anything. But again, I just want to thank all of the fabulous folks that we've had on the show to date. I've learned a ton. I hope you've learned a ton. And if you find that it's valuable to you, there's a specific way that I'd like to ask you to support Still Growing, and that is to leave a review for the show on iTunes. And I wish that Apple would do a better job of making it easier for folks to leave a review because what it requires of you is that, first of all, you have to find the show. So you have to Google it. And I would tell you to Google still growing iTunes. And then once you get there, you click on the button that says uh, leave a review. And I think at that point, it asks for your Apple ID. So now you've got to enter your password. And then I think you go to ratings and reviews and you leave a review. But here's the thing. Guess what? You leave the review and it doesn't show up. You know how on Amazon, if you're reviewing a product, you write the review. And for the most part, I think it shows up pretty quickly. Not so in Apple and iTunes. They uh, take time to review it. So they really do, I guess, a good job of vetting the reviews. But at the same time, it's frustrating for folks like me who do podcasts because First of all, it's tough to get people to leave reviews because they are usually doing something else when they're listening to the podcast, whether they're driving or biking or doing laundry or what what have you. They're usually not right in front of their computer. And then because of the fact that you've got to enter a password and click, 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 click to get to the point where you can finally leave a review, it's really tough. I know there are some really excellent podcasts out there that have only a handful of reviews, and I know that's the case with Still Growing. So... The amount of reviews, unfortunately, right now does not reflect the quality of the show. But at the same time, I know moving forward, uh, reviews are really going to matter in terms of how shows are found in the podcast directory. Long story short, if you appreciate the show, if you like listening to the show, I would really, really appreciate it if you would leave a review for the show in iTunes. So today's show is special because it was my very first time doing an interview with a guest on Google Hangouts. And so Stephen and I uh, did a hangout back in February, and the show was recorded, so there's YouTube video of it. So if you'd like to see the video, all you have to do is go to Google and type in SG for Still Growing 521, which is the episode number for this show, and you can actually watch the video of my interview with Stephen Devlow. 
I actually connected with Stephen thanks to Twitter because I was reading some of his tweets about the environment, and I became very intrigued about what he was doing with his company, Earthworm Technologies. You know, I listen to a lot of entrepreneurial podcasts in my spare time. And one of the things I hear over and over again is that to create a successful business, you need to solve a problem. And I think that's what Stephen is doing so brilliantly because food waste going into landfills is a huge issue. And Stephen has put together a business model that really differentiates what he's doing and sets himself apart from the competition. I think he's incredibly strategic, a thoughtful steward of the environment, and frankly, ahead of his time. Stephen is hoping to change the world through his business model, and I know he opened my eyes to the problem of food waste and the viable solution he offers with vermicomposting. And if you've ever been curious about vermicomposting, you're going to get really good information from Stephen Dovlo in this interview. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first Google Plus Hangout edition of Still Growing. And my guest today is Stephen Dublo of Earthworm Technologies. Um, welcome, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be your first Hangout um, interviewee. It'll be exciting. You know, we're going to take the audio from this and we'll use it on the podcast. So the podcast episode will go live probably in a couple of weeks. So for the folks who are watching the show live tonight, uh, they get a a chance to kind of preview what's going to be on the podcast later on in the month. But why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You have a fascinating background because you didn't start out in horticulture. You were an MBA graduate with a career in corporate finance, right? That's right. Yeah, my uh, my background is uh, on the corporate finance side. I went to University of Chicago and studied economics, and then you know went back and got my MBA. Spent most of my years doing investments, investment banking, and also looking at you know buying out of companies, financing smaller, mid-sized companies. The last few years, I've had an opportunity to look at you know different things, and always sort of always sort of gardened on my own as a stress relief for myself and got deeper and deeper into that and organic living and a little light bulb went on uh, in the last you know two years or so uh, where I thought I might be able to come up with a solution to help you know sort of di- divert all the food scraps going into landfills. Absolutely and tell us a little bit about where you live and where you garden now. So I currently live in Connecticut. I've also lived in Chicago before, um, originally from Belgium, uh, Europe. And, you know, my corporate finance job took me to New York City, where I met my beautiful wife, and now we live in uh, Connecticut. So we're we're Zone 6 um, gardening. Awesome. So before we get into the nitty-gritty here, let's review some of the common terminology we're going to be using getting into your field of expertise. Sure. Um, Verme or verme is the Latin term for worm, and so that's why so many of the terms that you're using start with that uh, root word. Right. Um, that's the prefix for a lot of things in your industry. So let's kick it off with vermicompost. Sure. Uh, well, vermicompost is essentially, you know, the the I guess the the, the product of the, what worms produce, basically. So it's okay. it's typically a mixture of uh, whatever you're composting. So you know, in in our case. It's, um, you know, food scraps as well as a carbon source. You know, some people use uh, horse manure or whatnot. So there's the natural decomposition and composting of that along with a mixture of worm castings. You know, we, and that probably, bring, you know, you're probably wondering castings sort of the next thing. Yeah, Cast- that's the next thing. Okay. Uh, castings are, are pure, you know, sort of the, the, the byproduct of the worm specifically. So if you're sifting it down on a more refined basis, you'll get a, a higher concentration of worm castings, which can be a part of vermicompost. Okay, so then what is vermiculture? So vermiculture is essentially just a term that's used for worm growing or worm farming. Okay. Um, it's just a practice of raising worms. And, and, you know, some farms are known to be worm farms. You know, so there are businesses out there that, basically raise worms for that sake only and they may sell it uh, to you know anglers fishermen um, maybe other vermicomposters and they concentrate purely on giving a perfect environment for the worms in order to increase that population and then there's also the aspect of more of what I'm doing which is you know using the worms to actually compost um, you know feedstock. 
So then what type of worms are ideal for vermicomposting for what you're doing? So, you know, there's, there's, um, there's many different kinds of worms out there. And the, the ones that you would dig up in your soil typically are not the same kind that you would use for um, ideally for, for vermicomposting. You know, the most ideal worm for vermicomposting or, or the one that's mostly used is a red wiggler uh, worm. They tend to be uh, thinner, smaller. I think they're a little cuter. Okay. <laughs> My, my 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 wife freaks out sometimes when she sees a big you know one of those big fat worms in the soil. They're not quite like that, but they are top feeders. So they essentially come okay. to the top of whatever, whether it be a tub or container or whatever you're using, and feed from the top. So there's def- there's many different ways that you can go about vermicomposting, but that, that that is different from other types of worms or like night crawlers have been have been mentioned before. Uh, they tend to be deeper burrowing worms and might not be ideal for home vermicomposting. How does the term organic apply to vermicomposting or vermiculture? So, you know, organic is sort of one of those terms that was, you know, kind of created over the last, you know, I don't know, 60, 70 years because we started using, uh, you know, conventional farming methods. you know, a lot of the, the chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and things that we use. So uh, it's interesting when we use organic in the term of, you know, sort of vermicomposting. And I'd like to think of it as trying to come up with as pure of a product as possible. And that means also, you know, concentrating on your feedstock and making sure, you know, because just like our bodies, you know, whatever you put in is what you get out. So if you're eating yeah. junk food all day long, well, your body isn't going to be too healthy. Yeah. Um, you know, one could essentially feed anything to a worm and, and get some sort of castings, but, you know, the end product will vary significantly, you know, in quality, depending on what you use. So, you know, we choose not to use um, leftover leaves or anything from the municipalities because we don't know whether it's been chemically treated or not. You know, we can't be sure of that. There has been some research that shows that worms do break down a lot of those things, but, you know, we try to be as pure as possible when it comes to that. So, you know, helping the environment by taking food scraps, but we're not, we're not accepting just anything like oil and, and, you know, food scrapings. Some people do do that, but we try to, we try to zone in on a, on a good quality product. Okay. I know we haven't talked about this, but then what is the, the, the worms are living in. I mean, I know you're adding, you're trying to add organic matter for the input, but what do you start out with? A home vermicomposter could essentially, you know, usually they, they encourage that you, you know, you use your food scraps or whatever you need, and they need bedding. So you could use uh, waste paper, uh, newspapers, hay, things like that, fiber source. We tend to actually pre compost all our things, uh, you know, all our feedstock first. Oh, you do? So, Yes, we do because we we look to take out the pathogens and wheat seeds. Although we don't really have that much issues with that, you know, it helps break down the whole feedstock first, so it's easier and also faster and, and more efficient for the worms to break it down. Uh, so for us, that's not that much of a problem. Okay, how about verma tea? Verma tea. So verma tea. You know, there've been many different uh, terms used in the industry that 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 get very confused. I think. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about warm tea, which I guess, you know, verma tea as um, some sort of an extract that you take from from the um, verm compost. There are some articles out there that aren't quite correct. Uh, you know, I've seen some articles out there that talk about running water through your actual vermicompost system and then collecting that. Um, you know, that tends to be leachate. So, you know, leachate isn't quite the same thing as warm tea. Uh, it can have toxins in it, and it, it can be very concentrated, so you can burn your plants. So you have to be very careful with it. We we don't we don't suggest using leachate as as warm tea. But what what I look at, you know, and I tend to call it an extract, um, some sort of an extract, is uh, using a an end product of warm castings or vermicompost, and then steeping that in water. And some people do also add, you know, some sort of an aeration system to boost the my, microbial population and add a sugar s- source. But, um, you know, that tends to be very short-lived because the microbes eat all the molasses or sugar or whatever people add to it, and then then, then they crash, and then everything goes anaerobic and kind of smells and, and, and isn't good. So we, we tend to just use extract prob- you know products by taking our uh, warm castings and steeping it in water for, for a period of time. 
And adding too much water like that to your to your worm's environment that can't be good for them, right? No, in fact, you know that's that's it's really important. Just like in the regular composting process, you know, worms are living beings just like the rest of us. You want to have a proper mixture of food and moisture, oxygen, you know, the pH level of of, of the um, of the bin. It, it, you know, these are important things, or your worms will die won't populate properly or won't be, you know, transforming that, that feedstock properly. So yeah, adding water probably isn't the most ideal thing. Yeah. Out of curiosity, do even the most experienced worm farmers need to start over from time to time? <clears throat> I think, yeah, probably. I, you know, I, I went to the, um, the vermiculture conference and, uh, you know, I, things can always happen. And there's many different ways you can go about vermicomposting, you know, out, out west, um, People can do things outdoors because the weather's great, and uh, you know, out east and in the north, not so much. You have to think about insulation, and um, you know, we have weather issues. They have pest issues. You know, birds like worms. <laughs> so there's definitely you know scenarios where where things can happen, and, uh, and your population can die. But I, I think you can come up with proper systems to to mitigate that. Okay. How about acidity? What is the optimum pH for worms? The, the red wigglers have a pretty big uh, range. Um, they're pretty resi- resilient worms, so they, they have a pretty big range of temperature and, and um, pH levels that they can live in. But, you know, most ideal is really the closest to neutral as can be. So, you know, sort of okay. 6.5 to 7. Awesome. Now, all businesses have uh, great stories of their beginnings. Tell us about the beginning of your company, Earthworm Technologies. I was really into organic gardening. Most gardeners, you start off slowly, you start learning things. And as you get excited because you're doing things right, you start learning more. And, you know, finally got to the point where I was looking at, you know, composting because I had extra food scraps at home that I didn't want to throw in the landfills or in our garbages. You know, came across vermicomposting um, several years ago. And what an efficient, you know, proper and efficient way was to, to deal with that food scrap waste. And... You know, as I was researching more and more about that, uh, the benefits of worm castings and vermicompost are really so, so many more than you can even get from compost or even aged manure. You know, there's a lot of things in common, of course. I was looking, you know, more and more into that and thought, you know, wow, what a great product and what a huge waste issue we have in this country. Everything, you know, gets thrown into garbage bags and then thrown into landfills where essentially there's no oxygen that helps, you know, naturally break down uh, food scraps, for instance. So it goes anaerobic, it causes, you know, a buildup of methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. And, you know, most of it doesn't get composted or anything. So, you know, I uh, started, you know, thinking a little bit and and came up with earthworm technologies as a way to basically, you know, try to um, set up some sort of a conversion program and, you know, get people and businesses to start diverting food scraps from going into landfills and instead, you know, giving it to me and, you know, we can divert it from landfills and at the same time also focus on coming up with a very strong uh, soil amendment that we can put back into our earth. Yeah, something you were very compelled to take a stand on and turn into your livelihood, right? Right. Now, I noticed one of the things that I love about going to your website is you have that great video at the very beginning of it, at the very top of your um, website, and it and it basically illustrates what happens to our food waste. It's a real shame, isn't it? It, it sure is. It's a uh, it's a nice illustration. You know, I left the uh, left the source on on the video. It wasn't done by me personally, but um, it was a, it's a very nice illustration for people to go to and really show. What's, what goes on with our food, because um, I don't think a lot of people realize it. No, I agree. Now, your mission statement is also pretty awesome. Was that something you knew right off the bat, like it was fully conceived for you, or did it evolve over time? Yeah, it's it's one of the first things uh, that I think I thought of, and it was quite easy, I thought. Um, it's... Um, so essentially, my you know my mission mission statement is a kind of a multi step uh, statement, and the first one is really make it cool, easy, simple, fun for people to to basically recycle. And I think that goes back to I just remember having a, a friend in college, and we went to go visit his older sister, and she was into gardening and composting and all that stuff. And I just remember being at her house, and like there was a smell, 
in the kitchen and decades ago you know and actually still now you have a bucket and you throw everything in there and as soon as you close that you're blocking all oxygen which is essentially what we do in landfills and putrid smells start building up and it's uh it, you know things get slimy because there's a lot of nitrogen and uh, we want to think of you know as part of our process something that would not smell um, and we've had pretty good success with with the way we do it and also in the same process creating a, what we think is a premium product so we really concentrate on a high quality product but you know um, and we also big on charitable contribution so I'm making that part of the, the mission statement and the, and the uh, operations as well so it's uh it's one of those things when i first started thinking about you know what did i want to stand for and those were the things that came up that's awesome now i know that there is still a lot of uh, you mentioned educating the public but <clears throat> for yourself you also need to stay current in your field in your particular niche and when you and i talked earlier you mentioned some of the research that's been done by cornell university right. um how do you stay current in your market? What are some of the sources that you like to um, refer to time and time again? It's a lot of um, book reading. There's a lot of great books out there. You know, I, I attended a permaculture conference late last year. Uh, that was helpful in trying, you know, talking to other people that are doing the same thing. Uh, you know, grand scale operators, small scale operators, as well as professors showed up uh, and, and shared their research. So, uh, you know, I definitely think that people, you know, that are interested in this area should. Um, you know, stay on stay on top of that research and and just constantly reading. I mean, there's always new things coming out and, and a lot of new people and businesses that are coming into the industry are you know tend to want to share you know their findings. I know we were talking in the green room and you mentioned the book Teeming with Microbes. Can you share a little bit with us about why it's one of your favorites? Yeah, that's a great book. Um, I, I think a lot of people glance over it because it's kind of a microbiology book. Um, but it's very well written. I think anyone can pick it up and, and follow along with it. But it really goes kind of hand in hand with organic gardening, which is all about the soil. How can we make the soil healthier? It talks. It, it really goes more into detail about all the different elements of what make a healthy soil. And um, you know, once you start thinking that way, I think uh, worlds open up. And, and especially if you're uh, a composter or a vermicomposter, I think if you um, you know, start focusing uh, on this book and what it has what it has to say. You can start thinking about how do I get a, the best quality product that I can personally produce. I loved one of the first things you shared with me was the soil test uh, or the shovel test um, to determine whether or not you had healthy soil. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, it's a very simple test, and you know, it's it's one of the many things that that I read. And when I come across good tips, I try to tweet them around and you know, uh, put them on Google Plus and. So this is pretty easy, you know, get a spade, you know, we all have one for gardening, you go into your soil, you know, go, go into your backyard and just pick up, you know, just uh, shovel up a, one spade of soil. And, you know, if you have at least five worms, you're probably pretty good. But if you have less than that, you probably have some, you know, some soil issues. So I, at that point, would, would highly suggest, you know, getting probably a soil test done and make sure the pH levels are, are, are fine. Or if you need more organic matter, amending your soils with compost and world castings and things like that. So, but it's, a, it's kind of a quick and easy way, way to tell because earthworms will thrive where the environment's great and they'll leave where, where it's not. Absolutely. I love your logo too. I know it's something that you gave a lot of thought to. Um, can you describe your logo for folks who are listening who haven't seen it yet? And then also tell us how you developed your logo because you put a lot of thought into it. Right. Um, so the the logo is one of those things where, you know, my wife and I kind of came together and when, we, when I was discussing the idea for the business and, uh, you know, I guess it's pretty simple because, you know, there's, there's, there's earth, the earth, the globe, in it and as well as a earthworm so it's uh, i guess not that uh creative um but you had many different ideas for it um and it, this just seemed like the most optimal way of going about the logo um there was you know i put a lot of thought into it because there's a lot of composters and green type of uh, businesses and they tend to have green and brown colors and logos that i think we're all used to seeing uh, and, I, you know, as part of the industry and what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to, you know, I use social media a lot. I try to educate and, and uh, you know, teach people what's going on with the environment because some of us know and some of us are too busy with our, you know, daily lives to, to realize. 
Um, so I wanted something that people could kind of latch on to and something that was easily brandable across, uh, you know, the blog that I keep as well as the social media efforts that I do and, and eventually, of course, the marketing of the actual product. So I, I, you know, I ended up using a crowdsourcing model where I created a, um, uh, a contest, basically. So, uh, you know, put a spec out there for what I was looking for and, you know, had several designers come in with ideas and then fine-tune it from there. And kids were motivating for you, right, when you were designing your your logo? Yes, actually. I mean, you know, that's part of the educational process, you know, trying to educate our future generations. And, I, you know, I, I wanted to I try, I always try to think bigger, bigger picture. You know, you should definitely have a focus, I think, when you're working on an entrepreneurial idea. Um, but you should also have your eye on, you know, what if my idea is actually very good and it grows and, you know, what, you know, let's think about, you know, kind of the bigger scope and then focus on the immediate scope for now. So part of that was, you know, how can I, you know, obviously brand a logo and how can I educate? And of course, also, who knows, you know, going to schools and educate children and what would, what could they relate to? Uh, and, you know, most people can, you know, go on our website and see the logo. It's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a cute cartoony worm with a, uh, a leaf sticking out of its mouth uh, next to the earth. So, and and we also chose the colors to be a little bit different, still feeling environmental, but something that would be different from the rest. So we made the warm orange. It was originally green, and I, I don't I didn't want it to be mistaken for uh, a pest control company. You know, if it was a, <laughs> a, a, a bug or something, <laughs> a slug. <laughs> well, I so think it, he's it adorable. He, this little guy, is totally adorable, and. I mean, you even gave thought to, I mean, how much of a smile this little guy should have. Um, let me see if I can blow him up on my iPad here. I'll just kind of show him. Well, I don't know if anybody can see that, but he is adorable. Let's see. This is Sam. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> he's just cute as can be, but he's got kind of a smile. His mouth is open, so he's chewing. Right. And and there was some debate over his eyebrows too, right? <laughs> You actually remember that? I do remember that. Yeah, he, when he first came out, he uh, he had like kind of a an eyebrows eyebrows facing down, and uh, he, he looked very angry, you know, like angry. And <laughs> part of me kind of liked that because you know, you know, we're angry that we're Passion. doing all these things to the world, you know, and and and, and the, the worm should be angry at us and you know telling us to do something. But uh, I thought that would uh, turn off some people, so I, I wanted to make him happy, you know. Nice, happy. So yeah, we went through the eyebrows, the different, uh, the different mouth shapes, and even the leaf. You know, there was like I think there was a banana peel before, and so there was a there were a oh, few wow. things uh, that we played around with, and uh, this was the final sort of the final results. Awesome. So I know educating people is something you're passionate <laughs> about. You have a very you know friendly logo, a very you know worthy mission statement, um, but you still have to. Um, educate people right before they can get on board with what you're trying to accomplish with your mission statement and with your organization. Could you share uh, some of what you've learned about the issue of food waste in our country and what happens to it once it leaves our homes and why vermicompost is such a good solution? Hmm. That's a loaded question. Um, well, you know, in the U S uh, as we all know, uh, you know, predominantly, especially in urban areas and, and even in rural, rural areas, um, you know, we have, we create garbage at home. Um, we do have some recycling programs that have basically grown over the years, um, you know, plastics, uh, paper, things like that. But uh, food, food waste still gets thrown into garbage bags, um, which I'm sure everyone that, that is watching or listening can relate to. You, you know, whenever you're done, you're, you know, you're cutting your broccoli, you have the stalks, you throw in the garbage, you know, carrots, potato peels, um, and food scrapings, everything you throw in a, in a garbage bag. When you're done, you tie it up and you throw it in a big garbage can <clears throat> outside. So you then, you know, the, the, the waste hauling companies come by, pick all those things up, take it to a transfer station, dump everything there. And then, you know, depending on your municipality, they might you know, have a solution for it. Some of them might get incinerated, which create issues. And other things might actually, uh, other garbage might actually be taken and hauled off to a landfill. So, you know, essentially, if you want to think about that, I don't think a lot of people think about what that actually means. I mean, we're, t we're talking about picking an area, digging a hole, 
throwing all that stuff in there and then capping it off when it's closed. Mm -hmm. um, so, in, you know, in the United States, we create over 500 billion pounds of total waste per year, of which, you know, the, this number, the percentage kind of changes, but say about 15% of that is, um, is food waste. Uh, so, you know, 80, 80 billion pounds of food waste to get thrown in the landfills. Um, you know, 97% of that goes to landfills. There are obviously some organizations and farms and things like that that um, compost. So, but that's still adds only up to about 3%. Um, so, and if you want to put that in perspective, you know, a, a family of four, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we do, right? You know, we, we overbuy and we end up throwing uh, wasting food, uh, you know. Absolutely. I think there was a statistic I read that about 25% of the food, um, prepared or purchased gets thrown out. You know, I can so believe that. Pretty wasteful. Yeah, you know, we go out and we buy eight bananas and we don't get to that eighth one, it turns brown. It's not quite the way we like it, so we throw it out. Yep. Um, <clears throat> you know, food waste is the third largest category of municipal waste in the United States. Um, a lot of landfills are already being closed up. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, when you throw food waste into uh, into a landfill and there's no oxygen to, to really help out with that aerobic process, uh, it turns anaerobic, so it creates methane. It's a very different process than when you're actually actively composting it. And, uh, you know, as, as we know, methane and carbon dioxide are, are not great uh, greenhouse gases, but methane is about 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, food waste is, pretty, is, is the number one material taking up landfill space and um, you know, landfills are the third largest source for methane in the United States. So it's, um, it's all, you know, terrible, terrible things, especially when we have solutions to, to, you know, to care, take care of these problems. We can't, we can't keep, can't keep stuff in all our garbage in the earth and, and then it goes nowhere. Yes. Well, and I know a lot of people are probably thinking to themselves, I mean, in terms of vermicompost, how does that differ um, when you think about other types of uh, compost products like manure compost and all the varieties that are on the market today? How does vermicompost compare to those different types? Right. So, um, you know, all those things are good. I mean, you need manure management too. A lot, a lot you know, a lot of dairy farms, horse farms, pig farms, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, manure creates methane. So, you know, uh, composting manure and aging it is, is, is a very good method to, to, you know, manage the manure on, on farms. Uh, it, it has, uh, you know, bacteria and uh, uh, nutrients and things like that. It can go back in the soil. Compost is the same thing. Uh, and for those, you know, who might not know the difference, composting is essentially trying to come up with a nitrogen and carbon ratio that's ideal, you know, sort of 30 to 1, and then the natural process of, you know, microbes building up and feeding off and, and decomposing um, that uh, feedstock, I guess, uh, takes over and creates heat, and then increasing the heat will also, you know, get rid of pathogens and weed seeds and all those things, and eventually, depending on the process that you use, um, you know, whether it's in windrows or you're using, you know, uh, bins or tumblers, um, you can come up, you, you come up with a, uh, a soil amendment at the end. Um, those are all great things to do. Obviously, I think warm castings takes it to another, you know, another step. Uh, the the microbes that uh, are found, you know, are found in warm castings have been found to contain up to 100 million microbes per gram. Uh, so about 20 times more that can be found. Um, if, if you weren't, weren't looking at warm castings, um, you know, it, it creates soil structure, porosity, uh, neutri it can neutralize, normalize pH levels. So it's great if your soil is off, uh, you know, it has, is more alkaline or more acid, um, more acidic. Uh, so it creates a better root environment for any plants, flowers, um, edibles that you might be growing. And uh, it adds, you know, more importantly, a, a, a microorganism um, you know, environment, uh, which, and, and, and if you read the book that I mentioned earlier, it would describe why that's all important. Uh, you know, it's too scientific to get into now, but it's, it's really beneficial in general and, and can actually, uh, you know, when you think of um, conventional farming and the use of fertilizers, uh, we've become a nation of, you know, want it now, want it quickly. And we've essentially created a conventional farming method that uh, you know, where we're mass spraying pesticides, herbicides, uh, uh, fungicides, and, and uh, you know, providing 
convent, uh, or, or chemical fertilizers. And, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're creating a lot of issues, you know, because we, the pesticides and everything are killing everything. So they're killing, you know, good bugs, uh, good pollinator, you know, bees, uh, butterflies, uh, ladybugs, things like that. It, it kills everything. I mean, it, they, they're not going to sit there and start figuring out which is bad. Yeah, they don't uh, discriminate, do they? They don't discriminate at all, you know, and, and they get rid of good microbes too. You know, we always think, I think we always think of, you know, microbes and bacteria, oh, it's bad, I got to wash my hands. But that's yes. you know, not necessarily true. There's a lot of very, very good beneficial bacteria that you start killing off as well. And that's why you're killing off the soil. And, you know, worms eat off of that bacteria. They're not eating the food. They're really actually eating the bacteria that's breaking down that food. Uh, and then, so that's the reason why you tend to find, you know, uh, a decreased worm population in, in uh, conventional farmed um, uh, soils. So, you know, bringing all those things back with, with you know, uh, the organic matter uh, that's been stripped from the soil, you know, is what would be added back with worm castings. Um, you know, I think conventional you know, conventional farming methods have really you know stripped stripped our soils of a lot of a lot of nutrients. Absolutely, you know that leads me to um, we have a, a question from um, someone who's watching right now, uh, Maria Eugenia, and she asked since you know a lot about worms and perhaps a little off topic, but she had heard some time ago that there were some worms that eat plastic in a way that they could recycle it and others that could actually create plastic. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't actually. Um, that's kind of new to me. I mean, uh, I think worms can pretty much, you know, they're like a big vacuum, you know, so they, they, they work things in and they grind it down and they, they excrete it. So if it's small enough, it's going to go through. So maybe, maybe it, may, it may seem that that's what's happening. Uh, I'd have to look into that. I, yeah. that, that doesn't sound uh, familiar to me. It would be hard to believe. I only know my husband uh, is a chemical engineer and he started his career in plastics. Mm. And um, believe me, I am no expert in the world of plastics, but I've, I've heard at least some of the co the conversations that he's, that he's had about it. Um, and I know from him, you know, plastic's inert. So, you know, what you had just finished talking about was the nutritional value that even worms need in order to give us, you know, good vermicompost. Right. And so if there's no nutrition going in, it's hard to believe that there would be anything beneficial coming out. Right. Exactly. And if you're feeding, I don't know if you'd be feeding pure plastics, but uh, there's no, if there's no microbial population, the worms aren't going to be interested in it. Um, yeah. The only thing I could think of is maybe, you know, the, the, the biodegradable bags, maybe, maybe, you know, as part, as part of the composting mm. process, that stuff breaks down, but that's true. I don't know anyone that's, uh, you know, experimented with that. Hmm. So with any new concept or idea, there's often a lot of myths associated with it. And um, I know in some of our previous conversations, we've chuckled a little bit about uh, some of the things that people think about when they think about uh, vermicomposting. But can you help us debunk some of the common myths, myths that are associated with vermicomposting? Some of the things that I know drive you completely crazy because they're just simply not true. Right. Um Let's see. Well, I, I remember reading one uh, a while ago, something about uh, the liquid that you, well, it's, you know, a lot of them have to do with the liquid that you collect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me just say worms do not urinate and, and the moisture that you're extracting from the bottom of your worm bin is not urine and it's also not um, worm extract. It's leachate, like I mentioned before. So that's. So there's no worm pee. Worms do not pee. Nope. Okay. No, the only moisture that's that's you know that's collecting at the bottom is is the moisture from your bin from natural uh, decomposition of your food scraps or whatever you're using or as well as you know obviously worms have you know mucous membranes and things like yes. that that they that they use obviously um, but uh, the actual urine you know it's uh, it's an organism that's not exactly like the re like the rest of the animal kingdom so sure, that's sure. that's one uh you know that goes hand in hand obviously with the warm tea uh which isn't which is not the chain and that's that's a huge one because you know there's a lot of organizations like myself that really make it a point to try to create a, a high quality product and we find that that's extremely important because uh you know if if 
if you're getting a great result with one one bag, you should hopefully get a similar result with a second. Otherwise, it makes it very difficult for you as a gardener or farmer to try to simulate those those ideas. So, um, you know, there's a lot. I, I you know, I applaud people vermicomposting, having their bucket at home and all those things. But, you know, for the people out there that are trying to make a quick buck um, by, you know, throwing whatever they can find into those buckets and, you know, taking that liquid from the bottom and selling it as uh, some sort of a, a warm tea, um, you know, that's I, I find that personally very irresponsible. and It's just not helping the industry. And what's going to happen is customers are going to buy that product and something's going to go wrong. And, and then the whole industry gets thrown under. So, um, you know, I, I would suggest people, you know, it's really not that complex to come up with a, at least a minimally um, minimal quality product. Um, but, you know, do your research. I mean, the, the, the Internet's one of the greatest inventions out there. You know, I've, yes. I I love it. It just, you know, just like anything else, it can be abused. And 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 don't forget, there's no censoring really on the internet. So you know, just because an article is out there doesn't mean it was written by someone who knows what they're talking about. Uh, that's what I always tell people. So I always find multiple resources. You know, if I'm trying to look up something, I'm reading multiple sources and then zoning in on my own opinion, eventually. So and then you'll 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 notice by doing that 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 will naturally debunk uh, some things that you may find in the beginning. Well, I know one of the things that is a source of pride for you is that you've really tried to differentiate yourself in terms of your service, your process, and your product um, that you provide to your customers. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's actually great. I, I think we're at a cross point um, in in the U.S. anyway. I mean, Europe is kind of in a different uh, moving uh, differently. They've, they're, they're, they've already gone very green. They still have some ways to go. Um but I think, you know, we're kind of with uh, the advent of, uh, you know, GMO products and people focusing on that and health and, and you know, getting more of these articles uh, written and, and videos, I think uh, people are starting to perk their ears up. Um, and, you know, as part of that, you know, I see, you see a lot of uh, little companies popping, popping up all over the United States that are, uh, you know, offering a service where, you know, they charge a resident for uh you know, giving them a bucket and taking the food scraps and then giving it to a composting facility and then giving them some compost back, uh, which is great. That there's not, I, I, you know, we always encourage when everybody's doing that. And, you know, I, when I was thinking about estab- establishing the business as part of the mission I mentioned before, you know, we thought about, you know, the high quality product part. And, uh, you know, having been in, in marketing and investing in everything before, I'm also huge on customer service and, um, you know, consistency with that. So when I was thinking about how to establish this business, I wanted to be a little bit different from from from, from those businesses. And I think where we differentiate is uh, we really took time to come up with the proper bucket that should be used at home. Because if you're giving, you know, just I think uh, you know a lot of uh, little businesses are going out and just giving like a uh, a, a painter a painter's bucket. Um, and, you know, you're going to basically cause the issues I mentioned from my, my college roommate's uh, sister, which is you throw that stuff in there and you and you cover it just like you do in the garbage. You know, you ever notice you throw some leftovers in the garbage and a couple of days later you're like, what's that smell? That's because you're putting in a plastic bag and you're closing the, the garbage can. Now, you don't want to leave it open either because you get fruit flies and all that stuff. So Well, or you have a big dog like I do and then your dog <laughs> gets into it. I made a turkey last week and I, I didn't use the gizzards that I forgot and I put them in the garbage and I had it all over my kitchen when I got home. I oh, so he didn't, so he didn't mad at myself. He could at least eat everything and, you know, be respectful about it if he's going to do it. Yeah, well, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, so we... we we focused on we did some testing at home and to to my wife's chagrin i'm sure um and but finally zone in on on the right bucket that that is aerated um we use compostable liners and things like that and you know we have no smell i mean you know i i can put my nose above that bucket and you know maybe once in a while you smell maybe like some coffee or something like that but um it, you know it, do, it doesn't smell which is which is really great and it, so it's not naturally decomposing because it's got it's got the air um it does have a lid but it's aerated so it, you know there's no fruit fly issues or anything like that so um we focused on that because as part of the educating and, and, and also the service that we offer 
as I mentioned before, we want to make, you know, signing up a person is not that hard. I think everyone's willing to always give something a shot. But, you know, two weeks in, if if it's, you know, disgusting or smelly, people are going to give up on it and say, you know what, I'm going to let somebody else fight that fight. Uh, so we, you know, we, we're not going to work this hard to write articles and educate and just to drop the ball on simple things. So we really focused on that angle. Um, we, you know, like I said, with the vermicomposting side, you know, we, we don't take that, those food scraps every week and then go to a farm or some other compost place and say, hey, here you go. Um, here's our food scraps. Uh, let me know when you're done with that. And then we'll give some compost back to the uh to the uh, customer, because um, the problem with that is kind of goes back to my quality control, which is, you know, local composters do a fantastic job composting, and that's 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 great. But you know, from our purpose of having a quality product, I don't know what I would be getting back from the composters. They probably are accepting everything from uh, local uh, leaves, branches, um, and as I said, those could be chemically treated. Maybe they're not chemically treated. Um, they're if, if they're accepting food waste, they're probably accepting all food waste, which is great. Like I said, you know, if in, in creating a compost as such and, and converting all that is fantastic. And then if you sell that product, that's great too. But, you know, there's also a difference in different quality products. Um, we're focusing on, on a high quality um, product. So, uh, you know, I wanted to take all that stuff under my wing. Plus, I find it interesting and I want it to be part of creating that product. So, uh, you know, we see everything from beginning to end. Uh, I know what I know what goes in there. I know what comes out, yep. and and we're giving a, a very refined. You know, maybe we're not giving back 20 pounds of compost, or you know, we give back five pounds of warm castings. But that's a lot more concentrated and pure um, than 20 pounds of compost would be. So, you know, like I said, we 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 love our competition. We love that every everyone should jump on on board. But our specific model. Uh, I think is very focused and um, hopefully, you know, our customers will, will appreciate that. It absolutely is. And um, I wanted to also get your, or pick your brain a little bit because I, you know, you've mentioned the vermicompost uh, conference that you went to. Um, what are some of the key takeaways when you, when you bring together some of the leading thinkers on this methodology? What are some of the things that you took away from that conference? Uh, you know, more and more studies are being done um, on vermicompost. You know, I, I, it, what I have learned is that the composting industry has been pushing for years and years for, for standards um, and quality control of composting products. And, you know, it's, it's always hard when you're educating and when you're trying to establish a standard. Yes. Uh, vermicomposting, you know, it's kind of... It's been around, but it's you know it's had it's had its ups and downs. So I, I think it's kind of being pushed to the side. Um, I, I think we the, the the people and companies that are vermicomposting are trying to come up with a with some sort of a standard amongst ourselves. We don't think the rest of the uh, uh, of the U.S. and and uh, you know even the, the composting council is is, this is we're probably not at the forefront of of their list right now. But uh, I think you know as as time goes on, I think we're We'll be pushing for that. Yes. Um, more and more studies are coming out, uh, predominantly by universities. Um, as I mentioned before, Cornell University, um, the University of Hawaii as well, that's doing a lot of um, research that we try to stay on top of. And they do, you know, germination rates. Um, they, they've, they've done studies where they soak the seeds in, in warm cast or vermicompost extracts. And, uh, you know, the results are amazing i mean they're really they're really good and and you know i'm going to be starting uh our you know sort of our own experience experiments as well we have tons of things written down that i want to test that haven't even been thought of yet um but one thing's for sure that uh, a good high quality worm castings product or a vermicompost product um used properly you know for starting seeds as well as planting any anything from uh Plants, flowers, you know, perennials, annuals, uh, as well as edibles, um, has has a lot of benefits and a uh, lot of potential that people aren't aware of yet, right? Absolutely. As soon as you mentioned manure, you know, we don't. I don't think of warm castings as manure. Right? Um, manure is really from uh, grass, uh, grass uh, eating uh, animals. You know, cows yeah. and stuff. Um, but, you know, people always kind of have that, you know, whenever you think of any sort of an excrement, you know, but, but, you know, when you think of soil, what, what, what is soil? I mean, soil is basically a breakdown of, uh, 
rocks, uh, minerals, branches, leaves, things that have naturally decomposed, and, and worm castings, essentially. I mean, that's what soil is. So the way we look at it is we're creating a product that's uh, that nature has figured out the most efficient way uh, to create uh, ideally, you know, in order to continue its growth. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think we can beat nature at what it can do, you know, most efficiently. So why not try to try to emulate it? Um, Absolutely. You know, I when I thought about doing this interview, I kept thinking about my reaction to throwing away a pop can or a newspaper. You know, I would never do that now. And that, you know, as a child of the 70s where, you know, we had the, you know, the littering commercials and uh, we actually have two recycle bins, like ginormous bins in our garage compared to one uh, garbage can because we recycle that much with uh, with a family of four children. Um, But I think for uh, vermicompost and um, this industry, it's getting people to begin to see food waste in the same way that we see a lot of our plastics and papers. Um, And one of the things I think you do a really great job with is how you use social media, because you're really not only trying to build brand awareness, but you're also trying to educate people about what you're about and how it can actually change the world. So um, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about your uh, social media strategy, um, how you like to use social media, some of the things that you do um, that I know there are a lot of people in the gardening industry that don't don't utilize um, social media to its fullest extent. And yet I see you all over the place, the logo and your face. And I think you do a great job. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's, uh, you know, a lot of time goes into that. Um, it's, and it's, it's very thought, it's, uh, I try to be very thoughtful about it, you know, because, um, social media can be good and it can be bad and you have to be very careful. You know, if you're coming off as a person on social media, it's different from a business. Yes. Um, mine is a little kind of a hybrid in between because I also, you know, write for, you know, uh, the blog under earthworm tech, which is essentially sort of my alias for it. Um, and is also the alias for myself and the business on all social media. So when I came up with the name and the logo, as we mentioned before, I also thought of, you know, being very consistent in my names for across all social media platforms. I think that's very important to just constantly establish that brand recognition. Um, and, you know, I, I would I urge other people and other businesses that are looking to expand in social media to really spend time figuring out the nuances of each each platform because they're very different and the demographics that you might hit are also very different. Pinterest is extremely different from Twitter um, and the tactics that you may use um, to educate on Twitter may not be um, you know, correlative to using on Pinterest. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I suggest people don't just start, you know, shotgunning um, everything out there because you know, you make one mishap on social media. The, the great thing about social media is it's really great for, you know, expressing an idea or or, uh, uh, or even a theme or a mentality, which is what we're trying to do, you know, our philosophy. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of go beyond what we're doing as well. We, you know, I, I tend to tweet about, you know, the environment, um, even so. And then on Pinterest, I might pin things that are about, you know, upcycling. Uh, yeah, we have a Pinterest board that's very popular um as well as a community that we building that we are building on google plus for repurposing things for the garden so you know we've seen a lot of repurposing things in general upcycling uh, but how do i turn that palette into something that i can use in the garden you can turn it into a raised bed um yeah. you can use you can use old tires as uh you know paint them and, and make them containers outside so there's a lot of cool things you can do there um but you have to know all the nuances of the different platforms in order to utilize them and maximize your effectiveness. So, you know, that's something that we, you know, as soon as I thought of the, the, the company and it's, it, well, as soon as I thought of the company and its operations, the first thing that came out was the mission and social media immediately. I started focusing on that because it also takes time to build a following and to, and, and to uh, become known in, in, in the various platforms for, you know, what you particularly stand for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're not quite at a point where we're selling our product online yet. We will soon. 
Um, but you know, I, we right now I'm really just educating. I mean, there's really no returns for me other than than, than that. And uh, I think if you're true and honest and and just you know show your passion throughout your social media, everything else will come. Uh, you know, because the most important is is to have followers that truly believe what you what you have to say, and then and then you know everything goes through uh, word of mouth from there. So I, I think you know these are probably things. You know, I'm not a super expert, but you know, these are things that I that I tend to kind of grasp onto. Absolutely. Now, I know we talked about how you enjoy helping people who who want to do vermicompost on their own, but also helping businesses that currently are composters and need support. And you do something that's maybe a little bit different from a lot of people in the industry. You're very accessible. And you offer a 20-minute consultation via Skype um, to these individuals to walk them through their process and maybe how they can... um, you know, take it to the next level, maybe get scale or learn from what you're doing. Um, right. Share with us a little bit about the service that you offer. Yeah, this is uh, something that I, you know, kind of, um, it's it's fairly new. Uh, I try to be, I try to be somewhat innovative in the different things that I think, you know, uh, I, I see a problem and I try to come up with a solution. And, you know, and as part of the social media and all the, the blogging and the things that we do, uh, we get a lot of questions in general, you know, and, and a lot of times when you're doing things at home, you know, even before I started this business, when I was gardening myself and, you know, maybe it's a new plant that you haven't dealt with or, or you got a plant that you were excited about and, you know, you, were, you didn't think about your zone yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you have something that just, you know, is in dire straits and you're going on the internet and you're Googling and one person says this and the other person says the opposite and you have no idea what you're doing. And especially with vermicomposting, I've come across as people doing kind of the home bins and they're like, you know, my worms are all gone. What happened? Or I have too much moisture. Or what are these little, you know, these other little bugs are they going to kill my worms? And, you know, it's a little nerve wracking because you don't want to kill your whole population. You know, it does cost uh, you know, depending on where you live, 30, 40, you know, 25, 40 dollars per pound of worms and things like that. So, um, you know, we're, we're always very accessible on all of our social media platform. Uh, I, you know, posted a, a nice graphic on Facebook saying, hey, you have any gardening questions? Just shoot me, you know, just just post something on Facebook. And, I, you know, I, I try to stay on top of these things. Uh, and then most recently I thought, you know, what if... Um, what if we, I created a, a little con- consulting um, sort of 15 minutes, uh, you know, $20 for 15 minutes. You can pay through PayPal. Shoot me a question. I'll let you know honestly whether it's something that's answerable and we get on Skype and we just discuss. And, you know, sometimes a person might just want to be like, hey, what's going on in this bin, you know, yeah. um, which is easier to see sometimes or talk or, you know, converse like we're doing. Uh, as opposed to, you know, shooting me a message, uh, which goes back and forth, back and forth. So I thought that might be uh, an interesting thing to offer to people. It's very easy, you know, this kind of new techie world that we live in. The worm doctor, right? Yeah, the worm. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh, I think he just came up with a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know you mentioned uh, before we go, I want to make sure that we highlight you. I know that you write for your blog and you do uh, write a lot of articles about uh, all the things that you're passionate about. Do you want to share uh, just a couple of them that maybe are top of mind for you? And then we'll make sure we put links to them on the show notes. Sure. Yeah. The, um, you know, I, I have a book an agenda that I keep and I, every time I think of an idea I start writing it down I'm like I have to blog about this and so unfortunately with all the things that we talked about the blogging has kind of pushed it a uh, push to the side for now because uh, I have so many articles I want to write but you know some of the I, I try to think uh, as I mentioned kind of out of the box and and one that I wrote recently that I think has gotten a lot of hype is you know we've had all this snow and all this ice and people have cabin fever and uh, you know, we're all antsy for the spring to get here and we're, you know, we're those first crocuses. In fact, that yeah. was one of the things I tweeted, you know, like dying to see this crocus. Um, but in thinking that I thought, you know, it's snowing and snowing and we're complaining about the snow, but you know, how can we use this snow? Why don't we just, you know, focus on what we have and, and deal with it. So I wrote an article on basically, you know, uh, you know, I think I called it, uh, you know, it's Jack Frost uh, uh, snowing on your gardening parade. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that one was, uh, I think, interesting. You know, I, 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 people can obviously read the article, but uh, I, I try to come up with some ideas of what you can do with that snow, including, well, depending on where you live, 
um, you know, harvesting that snow into a, a rain barrel and using it as natural rainwater source oh. um, when you need it later on. Um, you know, people don't really think about this, but ideally, especially from a vermicomposting standpoint, uh, dechlorinated water is, is ideal because if you think about uh, municipal water, the, what they put in that stuff, and, and for a reason, uh, chlorine, chloramine, all those things kill bacteria, and of course, they will also kill bacteria in your worm bin, uh, which is what the worms like to eat on. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's it's not detrimental at all, but, you know, to the extent that you can always make your system more efficient, why not? And especially if you've got... <laughs> I think 48 inches of snow build up yes. out there. <laughs> you might have more, actually, I think. Oh, um, my gosh. We did. We just got nailed with a, another, like, three, four inches. And then um, I just heard tonight we're getting more. So yeah, it's, it's not it's Minnesota's a sad place for gardeners right now. Everybody's <laughs> got pent-up demand to get in the garden again. So Are you zone five? We're Well, depending on where you're at, we're zone four... 4B, right where I'm at. Mm. So, yeah. So a greenhouse, I guess, then, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, so, you know, so I, I, I wrote that article. I think people found it amusing. Um, I read, I wrote an article back in the fall, you know, things that you can do in the fall. And, and as I said, I, I try to be efficient in my gardening, too. So, uh, you know, one of the things I had mentioned, for instance, was when you're going around and you're pulling all your old flowers, your annuals and all that stuff, uh, think about the reseeders in your in your garden. So you know, I um, I like rudbeckia. You know, I have all, mm. many different kinds, and a lot of times you'll just you take the flower, let it dry, maybe take the seeds, or or most people will actually just buy new seeds. Um, they're actually pretty cold hardy, or at least for zone six. Um, so I I tend to actually kind of dig a little soil and spread them in as I as as I go and cover them and. You know, next year I don't have to do a whole lot. So, uh, you know, just some tips like that. I actually have an article that's been dragging, but it's almost it's almost done. Uh, it's a little bit late, but it, it was about um, basically recycling your Christmas tree. Uh, you know, a lot of times we cut those beautiful Christmas trees. Um, unfortunately, just literally for a hot, you know, for a holiday season, which is kind of terrible in a certain way when you think about it. But mm -hmm. that's that's you know, and, and that's fine. You know, those are those are. Uh, uh, cultural things we do and yep. I have a huge eight foot tree myself but it feels so bad you know after you know three four weeks I'm like I can't you know do something with this you know so uh, I'm writing an article currently about how you can use that tree after the holidays several different ways um, yeah. you know cutting the branches and using it to cover your planters uh, stripping yeah. the pine needles and using that as incense for instance um, yeah. putting the tree outside for the birds for the birds to have some shelter things like that so yes. uh, that will be posted soon my mom and dad always take their their tree and they or they'll find some brush when they're in the woods and they always put it underneath the bird feeder because otherwise the birds huh. are kind of out in the open and exposed in this way if it's under the bird feeder they've got a place to right. you know, to get away from the predators that are on the lookout for them as well. And so even better if you're able to jut that tree in the middle of the lawn so oh, no, yes. no one can get to it. I've um, got a neighbor that uh, whenever it's time to get rid of the tree, they put it on their curb, but they always put it upright. And so when the garbage trucks come through, they never take the tree because they think it's a real tree. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, so then they end up with it until about April or May, and then they figure out they better get something done. So They but can, they can strip ahead. it. They can strip it and use the pine needles for the blueberry bushes because it's very acidic. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's a great idea. I like that one. Yeah, I think we'll do that this year as well. <laughs> that's awesome. So um, let's end the show by talking about how people can contact you. Give us your website, kind of um, where they can find you on social media, that kind of thing. Sure. So, um, you know, our website is www.earthwormtechnologies.com. Um, and... The blog is also on there. It's it's uh, you can see it's Earthworm Tech's gardening blog. Okay. Um, as far as social media, it's fairly simple. It's basically Earthworm Tech, uh, any T E C, um, not T E C H. Yes. On um, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, uh, Instagram. Although on Instagram, I have to say we're not active yet, but we will be. Um, and YouTube, which I will be starting to do videos shortly as well on um, Google plus for 
plus Earthworm Technologies, the, the full name. And I think those are the main social media uh, outlets that we use. Okay. That's, that's enough, really. <laughs> that is enough. Well, as usual, what we'll do is we'll put links to all of the things that you've referenced um, in the show notes for the show, and that's all available at sixfootmama.com under the menu uh, heading Still Growing Podcast. And you can find this show, and it will be episode uh, SG521. So, uh, Stephen, I want to thank you for being a guest on the show tonight. That was super fun. We, I think we did it, right? It was. I think so. Did everything tape? <laughs> I, well, I think it is. I'm going to hit stop broadcast, and um, we'll get a chance to look at it. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for having me on, and I feel very honored to be your first uh, video interview. In my first Google Plus Hangout. I'm <laughs> live on the air. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Good night. Have a good night. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Stephen for being my guest. I'll have all the information from this episode of Still Growing at SixFootMama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing podcast. Of course, you can always find me at SixFootMama.com or on Facebook.com backslash Still Growing with Six Foot Mama. You can also email me directly at Jennifer at SixFootMama.com. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hey everyone, so it's after the show time and of course... I have something from one of my kids. Actually, it's PJ this week. He was the only one that didn't get uh, to do uh, something at the end of the show last week. And so I told him that this week it could be something just for him and that uh, he could do something that he was proud of. And interestingly enough, PJ just changed schools. He's now at the same school that Will and Emma are at, a charter school called Parnassus Preparatory has a strong emphasis on classical education. And PJ had an opportunity this past month to write his very first paper about Andrew Carnegie. And I thought it was kind of fitting, actually, because when I was sharing with the kids about what Stephen was doing with his earthworm technology company and how innovative uh, Stephen is being in his approach to this business, the kids were really, really fascinated. And so in the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation, I thought it was appropriate that PJ share his Andrew Carnegie paper with us today. Are you ready? Have you ever heard of Andrew Carnegie? Most people think of money when they hear the last name of Carnegie. But there is more to learn about Andrew Carnegie in this paper. I will tell you about Andrew Carnegie's early life, the values taught by his parents, his first jobs, his success in the steel business, and how he came back to values taught by his parents as he got older. Andrew Carnegie was born in Scotland in 1835. His father was a weaver. Sadly, he lost his job when machines could do his work. After this happened, she wanted to leave Scotland and emigrate to America for a job. Andrew was 13 years old when his family came to America. Andrew learned many different values from his parents, even though he had lost his job, Andrew Carnegie's father didn't pity himself. In fact, he wanted the world to be a better place. His father and uncle also valued helping people who were less fortunate. His uncle also taught Andrew the value of memorizing, memorizing information. When Andrew grew up, his first job was a bobbin boy and he got paid one twenty a week. Later, he worked as a messenger boy. He did his best every day. He learned about railroads, and he learned how to invest money. One day, Andrew sent out orders to help trains get around a train wreck. His boss was very happy that Andrew figured out what to do on his own. 
Andrew got started in the steel industry through his work in the railroad. Later in life, Andrew Carnegie came back to the values that were taught by his parents. In 1901, he sold a business to Jace Purant Morgan for $480 million. He was the richest man in the world. Then he gave to the people by donating to libraries, colleges, and schools. Andrew gave away, um... $324,657,399. And said the man who dies the riches dies disgraced. In summary, Andrew Carnegie had a very interesting life. His story started out in Scotland when his father lost his job to machines. In America, his success as the king of steel made him rich. Andrew didn't always do the right thing, like when his workers were treated poorly and were killed during a strike. However, his father's values of making the world a better place and help helping out the poor became important to Andrew at... The end of his life, Andrew impacted the world when he gave away almost all of his money for school, libraries, and communities. Now you know about Andrew Carnegie and how he made the world a better place by making steel and giving away his money by P.J. Eboy. With a little help from Dad there on some of the pronunciation. Have a great week, everybody.